Further along the line of reasoning that it is difficult to read all the code to find all the bugs is the use of dynamic analysis. Dynamic analysis is when you actually run the code instead of just static analysis, which is when you read it. Now, one of the most common and fruitful techniques is to utilize a fuzzer. Fuzzing is the act of feeding randomized acid into the attack surface of a program. So the fuzzer is the thing that is doing the fuzzing. It is an application or a test harness that feeds the random data into the program. Now, it very often finds bugs very quickly if it is an unhardened program where people have not programmed Paranoid. And therefore, it is actually a favored technique of real attackers. A defender's goal when fuzzing is to beat the attacker at their own game. They know that the attacker is going to feed randomized garbage input to their attack surface, and therefore they're going to feed themselves randomized garbage input to their attack surfaces before the attacker ever can. So this provides the defender with an advantage in the sense that they can do this sort of testing before the software is ever released and close down bugs before they ever make their way into the wild. On the other hand, attackers might have an advantage if they're willing to put more time and effort and CPU cycles and, and sophistication and everything else. They're willing to put more effort into the fuzzing than they have the advantage. So there's a variety of different forms of fuzzing and we'll start with dumb fuzzing, which is just truly random data. So if we imagine, for instance, that you know the attacker wanted to compromise some software that was parsing TCP packets, then they might know that, you know yes, there's some byte structure for everything, but I'm just going to feed a bunch of randomized data into that. So they don't even care what the structure is for TCP, they just feed random garbage in, and quite frankly, quite often, that will be enough to cause a crash, which they can then go analyze to see if it's anything about this acid that's being consumed that leads to a security vulnerability. Now, the next step would be something like template-based fuzzing, where they know that it's a TCP packet that's being parsed, and they can know something about the structure of the data fields within that packet. So they create a template based on the anticipated data structures, and then they feed in randomized data following the template into the code. Now, if it was just this, that would not really be that much different from dumb fuzzing, right? That still literally just is a bunch of random data that'll be parsed however it's parsed. The benefit of template-based fuzzing is that uh, there may be code paths that are unreachable with you know, random, completely invalid inputs, or you know, unreachable or reachable with extremely low probability because you know, if you're iterating through you know, four billion possible numbers and if maybe only like two of them are valid, well then you know, most of the time you're not gonna hit the code that you wanna hit. So template-based fuzzing allows people to you know, selectively take areas and make them into sane data so that you know, the data will be parsed more effectively. Then there's the technique called coverage-guided fuzzing, which basically creates a feedback loop within the fuzzer that prioritizes code going down control flows that have not been seen before. So essentially they say, I'm going to feed random garbage in, but whenever I see that that garbage causes it to take a different flow in the path, I'm going to like save that and reuse that later. So I like this particular picture, this extremely nice animation. This is a control flow graph of some particular code. And reverse engineers frequently look at code in its control flow graph form, where basically, you know, some node calls to another node, calls to another node, and then there's a conditional here. Maybe sometimes it goes this way and sometimes it goes that way. But anyways, this is just animating the notion of for a given fuzzer, when these nodes light up, that means that a given input has caused the control flow to flow down a given path. And if you just like pick any given leaf node on this thing, like let's pick this one right here, you know, eventually that does get hit with the fuzzer. So coverage guided fuzzer is trying to say like, let's try to make sure that we get through all of the coverage. Like let's maximize the coverage of the randomized inputs because the more coverage you have, the more likely you are to find vulnerabilities, right? If you only ever you know, hit a small portion of the control flow graph, there could be all sorts of vulnerabilities over here, but your fuzzer never finds them. So that's why coverage-guided fuzzing is extremely beneficial as well. So the nice thing about fuzzing in general, if you're a defender or even if you're an attacker, is that you, know, you don't have to bite off more than you can chew. You get to work in bite-sized pieces. So if you imagine that there's some application, my cool image viewer could be, Adobe Acrobat could be Apple Preview, could be Microsoft Word. There's some application and that application may take in and accept and parse and process and render 
a bunch of different formats. For instance, in this case, image formats, but it could be audio, could be fonts, could be video, etc. So if a thing supports a bunch of different formats, then you know in reality each of those formats is just its own unique attack surface this is a place that an attacker can feed you a png or a jpeg or a tiff and each of those could have their own unique vulnerabilities so realistically each of these is an attack surface unto itself and therefore a defender or an attacker can pluck out one of those attack surfaces and fuzz only that right in the context of an attacker it would mean just creating a bunch of jpegs and feeding it into the program. But in the context of a defender, if you're the person responsible for managing this code, you can take that JPEG li uh, code within your code base, maybe it's library, maybe it's not, and you can pull it out into some other project which is capable of you know, just wrapping and throwing a harness around that that is responsible for creating the randomized input and then feeding it into the JPEG. Maybe it has a template, maybe it doesn't, to start with, you don't need a template, right? You just start as simple and dumb as you want. And again, if you haven't been programming Paranoid, even a dumb fuzzer will almost certainly find crashes due to the consumption of acid. So basically, that's going to be the situation where, you know, this is an easy way for you as a defender or an attacker to find vulnerabilities and things. Now, there are, of course, drawbacks to fuzzing. One of the uh, biggest ones is the fact that what you get out of fuzzing is a whole bunch of inputs that cause a whole bunch of crashes. And consequently, you need to do things like deduplicating the crashes. So a bunch of different random values could all be creating the exact same crash. Maybe your code crashes any time a value is greater than, you know, half of two to the 32. So that means, you know, whenever the random value is picked on, you know, greater than two to the 31, then it crashes and less than two to 31, it doesn't crash. So deduplicating crashes and figuring out what is the minimum input necessary to cause the crash uh, is important as well because you know if a analyst, if the, the code author wants to go find what the cause of this crash is, they'd like something nice and simple that they can read and then they'd like to be able to you know step through the debugger with that very simple input so that it's very clear like what the root cause of that is. So you know doing the efficient deduplication and minimization is somewhat of a specialty unto itself. So this was just the quickest of skims through fuzzing. The reality is that this does deserve a class of its own. And hopefully we'll have classes for you to dive a lot more deeply into this content in the future to help you build your own fuzzers.